Hello there ladies and gentlemen, I'm Paul TX141 Walsh, welcoming you to an all new Ace in the Day gameplay for the arcade mode of War Thunder. In our final episode of 2017, we shall be reviewing the A35B, a French dive bomber coming to tier of 2 and a battery rated of 3.3. To provide you with a historical overview as to the Volte Vengeance as the A35B is derived from, and the subsequent development of the A35B you see on screen today, we begin thus. To meet the requirements of the French Air Force in the first half of 1940, the American Volte Aircraft Corporation designed a single engine dive bomber referred to as the V-72. This aircraft would be a low wing monoplane with a closed cockpit to fit a crew of two, using the air-cooled Wright Twin Cyclone GR2600 A5B5 1600 horsepower radio engine to power the aircraft. A unique feature of the design would be its ability to dive vertically without lift from the wings pulling the aircraft off target. This was achieved by the usage of a zero degree angle of incidence on the wing, this angle being the angle made by the wing mounting in comparison to the longitudinal axis of the aircraft fuselage. The drawback of this feature was that the aircraft would cruise along in the nose up position, reducing the forward vision for the pilot both in flight and particularly when trying to land the plane. Nonetheless, improved by the design's potential, the French Air Force placed an order for 300 V-72s with the intention of aircraft entering service in October of 1940. This was never to take place, however, with the four fronts in June of 1940. The V-72 would go on in life in British hands, whereby the British Pershing Commission, so impressed by the performance of the German Junkers Ju-87 in the dive bombing role, was looking for its own dive bomber for the Royal Air Force. With the V-72 being the only design available at the time, the Commission placed an order for 200 V-72s under the designation of Vengeance on the 3rd of July 1940. This order was expanded by a further 100 as placed on December 1940. The first V-72 prototype underwent its maiden flight successfully on the 30th of March 1941 and this would be followed by the first Vengeance as delivered to the Royal Air Force, designated AN838, flying for the first time in July of 1941 to continued success. With the production order expanded by a further 300 aircraft in June of 1941 under the Lend-Lease program, the Vengeance aircraft were given the United States Army Air Corps designation A-31. However, the plane would only see service in American hands following the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor on the 7th of December 1941 and the subsequent entry of America into the Second World War whereby in 1942, the United States Army Air Force commandeered 243 of the Vengeances intended for the Royal Air Force, operating them under the A-31 designation. Soon after, the United States Army Air Force ordered the production of an improved version, which was designated A-35. The improvements included on the A-35A subvariant the following. The operating of the engines, the 1,700 horsepower Wright Twin Cyclone, R2600-19 radio engine, increasing the armament to the following, four 12.7mm Browning machine guns on the offensive and one 12.7mm Browning machine gun on the defensive, compared to the original 7.62mm Browning machine guns used in both roles, and the addition of a four degree angle of incidence to improve forward visibility for the pilot. A total of 99 A35As were built. The A-35B, the plane you're seeing on screen today, was to follow, with the enhancement of the armament to six forward-fired 12.7mm Browning machine guns with three mounted to each wing, and the introduction of wing racks enabling the aircraft to carry an additional two 500-pound bombs externally on top of the 1,000-pound internal bomb load, meaning that the plane was able to carry up to a total bomb ordnance of 2,000 pounds. A total of 831 A-35Bs were built, 458 of these being supplied to the Royal Air Force, 121 to the Royal Australian Air Force, and a limited number of no more than 67 being supplied to the French Free Air Force in North Africa in June of 1943. The A-35B primarily saw combat service in Burma when it was seen as rather effective in environments of local air supremacy, being phased out of service by July of 1944 due to the arrival of superior fighter bomber designs. And with our historical overview concluded, let us take a look at how the A-35B handles in the skies of War Thunder Arcade. Today's gameplay is brought to you from the ground strike map, Merchant Fleet. For this we'll be using the following setup. Stealth belts for our offensive machine guns, the reason being that the stealth belts in our experience have proven to be the most effective, whereby the combination of armour piercing, armour piercing incendiary 
and incendiary rounds enables you to do good damage to enemy aircraft fuselages and have a higher chance of setting subsequent fires. Our gun convergence is set to 600 meters. The logic behind this being that due to our slower nature, we'll typically be further from our foes when we open fire and we need to accommodate this. And when we do go head to head against foes with nose mounted armament, such as the Messerschmitt 19 F4 and the Yakovlev Yak 3, the 600 meter gun convergence can bode well in those scenarios. Our defensive armament is equipped with the universal belts. Three quarters armor piercing sentry, they're able to do good damage to our position, but we're more reliant on our defensive machine gun to alert us to the presence of foes on our six, rather than relying on it to bring down foes who try to chase us. Our fuel load is set to the minimum of 30 minutes to ensure we can make it to the end of the game unscathed on fuel capacity, and we've opted to take the default secondary armament of two externally mounted 250 pound bombs and two internally mounted 500 pound bombs having already dropped the externals and while the interior mounted bombs in order to reduce the amount of parasitic drag and the additional mass on the airframe of the aircraft, allowing us to maximise our performance over the course of the game, although we will re reload the bombs later and we'll explain why. In the meantime then, we can see that the climb rate of the A35B is rather poor, particularly compared to the likes of other dive bombers that you'll encounter at your batter rating tier, such as the D4Y2, which we reviewed last week review available using the link in the top right corner of your screen as displayed now. But you shouldn't mock the climb rate of the A35B because you gain, gain a little bit of altitude over time. As we've seen here, we've gained roughly 800 meters altitude since the start of the game, putting us in a prime position to support our friendly fighters who could test the higher altitude regions of the sky at the start of the match, whereby this enemy Yak-9 is going to go head to head with our friendly Messerschmitt 19F4 and we're going to tip the balance of the dogfight in our team's favor. Coming in gradually, the Yak-9 is unsuspecting of our incoming presence. And what it means is, we can close the distance and use the long range of 50 calibre machine guns to rip them apart at a distance of 0.81 kilometers, taking off their left hand wing and enabling our Messerschmitt 19F4 to continue in their efforts. What we can see now is a B-25s coming towards us and that's something we do not want to go head to head with, as whilst we've got a rather durable airframe, if we go head to head with those 650 calibre machine guns, we're going to be dead regardless. So instead, we dodge and make our way towards the enemy P-8, a heavy bomber which once it's out of the game, will help tip the tide in our favour. Now how have you picked up two kills? What we've seen so far is that the 50 caliber machine guns do a ridiculously good amount of damage when you've got a sustained burst on target, and that the A-35B can take foes by surprise. Now what this means is having gained altitude supremacy in collaboration with our friendly fighters at the start of the game, we could now just sit up here and gradually drop our bombs on the main airfield. But the issue here is that we do not have a very good bomb load in order to bring down an airfield within a quick period compared to likes of say a PE-8 or a Year 2. Higher battery rating bombers but still ones we can see on a regular occurrence. So therefore we're going to drop a small number of bombs on the airfield but what we can also see is we can sit up in this position and intercept those enemy fighters or interceptors that will climb to meet us. And with the ability to use dive brakes we can actually control these dive runs much more easily compared to your standard fighter. Whereas we come around, we extend and retract the air brakes for a little bit, and then extend them once again. Slowing down our approach speed to the point where we're able to just pick the Yak-9K out of the sky over time. And because they had no support in terms of fighters or interceptors climbing behind them, we had no risk factor in terms of our ability to take on the opposition without taking return fire from the rear. Now of course if there were enemy fighters climbing behind that Yak-9K, we would have either aborted the run, or alternatively just made the run without the usage of the air brake it's very nice to know we can control our dive runs much more easily compared to some of our opposition. And we can also use the air brakes in reverse when we have someone on our six in order to cause them to overshoot or alternatively make things awkward in their pass, i.e. taking tighter angles in a turn. Now having dropped our bombs on the airfield, what we can see is that in a short dive, the overall energy retention of the A35B is rather strong. It is able to dive from 500 to 800 meters altitude pick up enough energy to then loop back up and regain all of the altitude it has just lost. And that means that the looping dive potential of this aircraft for taking out mini bases is very good. Even with the 1,500 pound bomb load, you can bring down bases rather rapidly over the course of approximately seven to eight passes from what I recall. Now, as we do not have any mini bases to knock out here, that is why we're not going to continue doing this diving loop run i.e. the diving bombing run, on the airfield for the rest of the game, because it's going to waste a lot of time and not be too profitable, and also it doesn't make for very entertaining gameplay for the review, and there's so much more for us to discuss. So we're going to make a full bombing run now, but once we've reloaded our bombs once again, 
we will be dropping the three of our bombs and going back to that initial configuration of just the single 500 pound bomb mounted inside the aircraft. We can loop up here and we can see how we're regaining all of the altitude we sacrificed in the initial dive, demonstrating the strong vertical energy retention of the A35B over a short boom and zoom pass. Or a short diving pass, we should really say. Now as we come about here, what about altitude performance? Well there's an interesting contradiction in this aircraft, which is that above 4,000 meters altitude, you begin to lose engine performance at a considerable rate. You begin to lose control surface responsiveness at 6,000 meters, so you never want to go above 6,000 meters. But, in going above 4,000 meters altitude, you essentially put yourself in a position whereby any plane that climbs out of spawn will need to at some point level itself out before it can continue to climb and intercept you which means you have the upper hand in intercepting them as they climb to meet you, which is why ideally you want to situate yourself at 4.5 to 5,000 meters altitude in a given ground strike game, such as what we're seeing here. But if you want to maximize your engine performance, you'll need to drop down to altitudes between 1,500 to 3,500 meters, at which point your engine is performing at its maximum and you've got the full responsiveness of your control surfaces. And by dropping altitude and diving on this P3Biz, we're able to knock them out by setting them on fire for another kill. But with the drop in altitude comes a number of hindrances, which is that you make yourself more vulnerable to enemy fighters and interceptors who would go after you. Now below 1,500 meters altitude, one has to consider that at that altitude and less, you lose your engine performance once again, and climbing below 1,500 meters takes a long period of time, compared to other altitude ranges, excluding going above 4,000 meters. So it really is a trade-off if you're going to operate down low, whereby you can pick up more kills if the enemy are not climbing, as we pick up another kill on the Hurricane Mark 1 there, but at the same time, you're then more exposed to the likelihood of opposition latching onto your six. And here is a prime example. We would like to change this bow fighter and take them out of the game, but we notice an enemy P400 gradually making their way over. The issue is we cannot catch that bow fighter in time to be able to rip them apart without exposing ourselves to the incoming pass of the P400, who was only two kilometers away. And based on the rough engagement speeds there, it is very likely that by the time we opened fire successfully on the bow fighter, I got into roughly 600 meters range, the P400 would have followed through to say 1.2 kilometers and we would not have been able to turn away and escape them. So you need to start judging distances if you're going to go to low altitude and try to intercept and engage foes who are in verbals or trying to attack your friendly ground unit. So it's a dilemma and you need to start judging distances more effectively than you would in your standard fighter. But coming about now and gaining a bit more altitude, what is worth noting is that if you can start off your low altitude operations at 1,500 meters altitude, you give yourself a safety net. Now what do I mean by this? Well sometimes, as we're seeing right now, the enemy can really dominate the low altitude portion of the sky, have a large number of fighters which are all baying for blood. We can see a Yak-9, an LA-5, a Focke-Wulf 190, etc. all down at low altitude and all looking over towards us, the focke 190 in particular. But in starting off at say 1,500 meters, and then if you go into a dive straight away, you have brilliant dive speed acceleration, which means you can pull the distance on the foes who would like to come after you, even a gradual dive, and you can get away. And in terms of comparing your dive speed acceleration, if you go into say an 80 degree dive, you'll be able to out accelerate the likes of the Focke 190A and the P47 D25 Thunderbolt, at least to start with, and that gives you a head start. And what I say to start with is that your maximum dive speed is 847 km an hour, and once you start getting towards 700 km an hour, your dive speed acceleration drops off rather drastically, giving your opposition with the higher dive speeds the chance to catch back up. But in a short dive, you'll have the upper hand, and if you can control it right, you're never going to be under threat of actually being hit. And what we can see here is we baited the Focke 190 to come after us, we dragged them onto our airfield, and our friendly anti-aircraft batteries will tear them to pieces, getting them off our six. So you do have to be very cautious, and what it does mean is that it can feel a bit of a, dare we say, campy experience in the A35B if you want to increase your survivability. You will need to play towards friendly skies. As we outlined in the historical overview, this plane was very successful when operating from air supremacy environments. Outside of those environments, it found life a little bit more difficult. And here we can see an LA-5 who is rather obsessed with coming after us from such high altitude and we're going to dive back towards our airfield once again to buy ourselves time in surviving and buy our allies time in taking down the opposition. Now they're going to get a hit on us, but fortunately for us this demonstrates the rather good durability of the A-35B's airframe. 
whereby you're able to take a large number of 20mm cannon shells before you're dispatched out of the sky, whether it be on the central fuselage or alternatively on the wings. The tail control surfaces are a little bit less durable, but they can take a good number of hits. As we can see, we've got a partially blackened tail control surface, but we're still able to use our elevator as normal. That means you can absorb some hits if it guarantees that you're able to get a shot on your fire, you're able to hit your ground target. Alternatively, it enables your friendlies to bring down the opposition. So do not be afraid if you have to experience that one pass which can do damage to you. And we're going to see that again later on. In the meantime, we look over towards our side and we can see a P-51 that's being dispatched over our airfield. And we're trying to find the next target to hit. And it looks like it's going to be that P-47 Thunderbolt in the center of the map, who's going after one of our friendlies, the LA-5. Now as we come about, let's talk about maneuverability. As you may have guessed by now, the maneuverability of the A-35B is extremely poor. Your turn circle is rather wide. It's wider than the likes of a P-47 Thunderbolt and a Focal 490A1. Even if you do decide to use your combat flaps, then you have to consider the fact that your horizontal energy retention or your turn fighting energy retention is poor and it means that your position are going to gain the upper hand rather rapidly. If you bring your air brakes in to cut your speed, you're only going to make things worse. So therefore, turn fighting is not your strong suit. But what we can see is that your control surfaces, despite their poor overall controllability, work well up to higher speeds. Now, there's no brilliant control surface, there's no standout one, but as we dive towards this P-47 Thunderbolt, what we note that unless we go over 600 km now, we maintain full controllability of all three control surface domains. Your roll rate, which will start to lock up at 600 km now, maximise him with a 50% drop off in performance at 700 km now. Your elevator suffers no lock up at any speed whatsoever, but it is a rather poor control surface in the fact that your loop potential is extremely weak whereby to conduct a loop you lose practically all of your energy even if you start your loop at 500 km an hour plus and your rudder starts to lock up at 600 km an hour maximizing at 750 km an hour with a 25% drop to off in performance so what we can see is that you're not penalized for flying at high speed which means your ideal speed range is in excess of 400 km an hour I'm not going to put an upper limit on it because really you're not punishing yourself for even flying into your lockup ranges because your already poor controllability isn't hurt too much. Therefore, if you can keep your speed above 400 km an hour at any point in time, you're going to be much more successful than flying at, say, below 300 km an hour, at which point your control surfaces become extremely heavy and it means you're practically on the verge of a stall, particularly if you've got all four bombs loaded. Now here we went head to head with the Yak-3, but we didn't get any successful hits on the airframe, but we do have a friendly coming in to interdict the situation. And again, we relied on our durability there in order to soak up the damage whilst we're able to pass by them and our friendlies knock them out of the sky. And we can see that we've taken some cannon damage on the left hand wing, but it's nothing that's going to kill us off. And it means we can carry on just sauntering about. But no one problem here. As we try to get back into the center of the map, such as that Yak 3, we're very exposed to being picked off or being hunted by an opposition. Sorry, an opposing fighter. And this means that in short, that once you're out of the fight, it's very difficult for you to get back into the center of the fight unless an opportunity presents itself. And we can see here that there's no clear cut air supremacy situation, which means we can't get over to the opposing ground targets and try to knock them out. Therefore, it does feel as though once you're out of the fight, you are out of it for the rest of the game and you're playing in a survivability mode, making sure that you don't get hit anymore. It's very frustrating, but it's something you have to live with. So outside of controllability then, what else is there to note? Well stall speed, one thing to note is that your stall effects start at 260 km an hour. Your stall speed is 170 km an hour, which is very high, but you'd expect that for the type of aircraft you're flying. And your stall recovery, you need to get all the way back up to 290 km an hour before you gain control of your control surfaces once more. Which means that whilst your stall is gentle, and the plane just gradually noses down, you're going to lose a lot of altitude and be very vulnerable when you hit your stall which means the usage of hammerheads is very dangerous and take a long period of time. But with the enemy ground units eliminated, it's time for us to take a look at the post-game stats. While well, 6 kills and 0.348 tonnes of base bombing achieved, we picked up 21,795 silver lines and 2,978 research points. To defeat the A35B in a given matchup then, I can recommend one or two approaches. Option 1 is if you're forced to fight this aircraft in a level flight engagement. 
whereby you'll need to turn fight against it. As at its battery rate and tier, it has a very weak turn circle compared to the fighters and interceptors it will face. As a last resort, the A35B pilot may try to conduct a set of rolling scissors and force you to overshoot by applying their air brakes, at which point you need to be careful not to drift into the firing line of their forward firing machine guns. Option two is if you're above this aircraft and see it operating down low, whereby you need to swoop in on it and use boom and zoom passes to wear it down and dispatch it out of the sky. Remembering that you'll have a safety net if you climb back up to altitude in the return of your pass, knowing that the A35B cannot climb after you successfully, and if you decide just to run away from it in a straight line, it's poor straight line acceleration which impedes it from getting above 250 km an hour on engine power alone, or 350 km an hour using more emergency power, means that this plane is never going to be able to chase you down effectively, and you just need to be wary of the long range of the 50 caliber machine guns it possesses. But by avoiding such circumstances today, and using the A35B in more of a fighter role, hopefully we've demonstrated that this plane can pop a few surprises against its more able opposition, whereby whilst it is a dive bomber, it can entertain the fighter role in given circumstances, particularly if it's able to support its team in achieving altitude supremacy at the start of the game, being able to latch onto the six of those fighters in those early engagements and help dispatch them, before loop bombing the mini bases and even the enemy airfield to an extent over the course of a given ground strike game. In an airfield domination game, it'll be able to swoop through the battlefield over short distance boom and zoom bases and pick off those climbing to altitude, alternatively those trying to land on the bases by either using its machine guns or dropping bombs on them. But at the end of the day, you must always remember that this is a dive bomber, not a fighter. But at the same time, when going up against it, do not underestimate it. Because if you drift into the path for its forward firing machine guns, then the only thing you have to consider is that vengeance awaits you in the form of a wall of lead. And so I've been TX141, and if you have enjoyed this video, why not leave a like, comment or subscribe for future War Thunder videos on my channel. I would like to just quickly say thank you to all of you for supporting me throughout 2017. I know it's been a rather rough year in terms of video output, and we've had our ups and downs, but you've been there all the way, and I appreciate your support from start to end. And here's to a better year in 2018. Have a happy new year, ladies and gentlemen. And until next time, as always, take care and good luck in the skies. Thank you.